I said, I love you, Kelly. And she said, I want you to listen to me kill myself. And I did. In this town where people borrow money they don't have to buy things they don't want, to impress people they don't like, the kids with stars in their eyes arrive by the thousands every week. But Kelly Van Dyke was not the dumb little kid waiting to be discovered in Schwab's drugstore. She belonged to Hollywood royalty. When I think about her, I see her walking down that aisle with her microphone in her hand. She was about this tall and that grin on her face. She was a remarkable little girl. She could sing, she could dance, and her dad was her idol, loved him to death. And they were inseparable. They traveled together. She would go on location with dad, Jerry Van Dyke, and superstar, Dick Van Dyke. And she would shine in unforgettable little comedies like My Mother the Car. Here's your old nickel. Now would it be selfish to ask for my rabbit? She's been missing for three days. How long ago it all seems, when Kelly Van Dyke had the wings of an angel and soared high over the Hollywood Hills. But why, why, why this? Yeah, but you know, when it gets really quiet out there and you can't hear a sound, all you can hear are the men breathing. This was the uh, investigation of the uh, apparent suicide of Kelly Van Dyke that occurred on the 17th of November 1991, about 5 in the afternoon, at her place of residence. Detective Mike Coffey is one of Hollywood's top cops. He's caring, he's compassionate, but he's also precise. Hollywood royalty notwithstanding, Kelly Van Dyke was just another suicide an angel who flew too close to the sun. But it was oh so much more than that for those who loved her. I can't even explain this feeling, but you don't sleep. You don't sleep and when you wake up and you have to realize the next day when you open your eyes for the first time, you think, oh no. You know, I, I just can't imagine life without Kelly. It's hard, it's really hard. And my mother's having the hardest time, I think because it was her baby. She was always some kind of a dream girl to me. I just, I've always adored her, always. And, um, you know, when, uh, when we got together, that was like a dream come true, you know. Uh, I, the happiest, day of my life um, was the day that I married Kelly Van Dyke. Bewildered, Jack Nance sits alone in the apartment where Kelly killed herself and reflects on happier days. But there were ugly days. <laughs> ugly days when Jack knew that wedded bliss was mixed with wedded hell. Days when Kelly was consumed in a haze of alcohol and drugs to soothe her unfulfilled dreams of being a superstar of the silver screen. To realize she was only a bit player on a screen where no one wins Oscars. Just reputation. Well, Kelly did go on to land a starring role, but it would be the last movie she ever made. What do you want to see? A bachelor party gets down and dirty, and Kelly's fall from grace is complete. And I think she just reached maybe a breaking point. And throughout that descent into despair, Kelly Van Dyke was haunted by the legacy of her famous name. I think she wanted her dad to say, you know, stop. You, look what you're doing to yourself. Up next on A Current Affair, the obsession that killed Kelly. <laughs> site of some of the ritziest homes in America. The estates here are million dollar monuments to the good life, the life that Kelly Van Dyke should have inherited. But something went wrong. Steve Dunleavy tells us why Kelly never found a home on Easy Street. Hollywood is no more Los Angeles than Wall Street is New York. But the gross tragedy of Kelly Van Dyke was that she
He lived in Los Angeles, but desperately wanted to star in Hollywood. It was an obsession with her to have a career in the business. The disappointment of growing up and not being a little child star anymore was uh, uh, something that, uh, that affected her, you know, her whole life. And she pursued it. But an obsession which so often can be magnificent turned ugly. I am Kelly Van Dyke Nance. I'm 33. 33. But I lie about my age all the time. Uh -huh. Okay. Today's date is what? October 15th, I believe. Yeah, you work for the Legally Productions of your own free will? Of my own free will, and I'm happy to do it. This Nancy was the saddest commentary of all. Kelly Van Dyke from one of the purest of show business families giving a videotape release, permission to be filmed in a porn movie. Milton Inkley, who played in and produced more than 3,000 pornographic sex scenes, directed Kelly. Some people come to do X-rated movies because they want to make a lot of money. Some people come to do movies because, um, for a number of reasons. Kelly seemed to come to do them because she really wanted to do them. While father Jerry Van Dyke was playing to a family audience in the TV series Coach, daughter Kelly was playing to an audience that was far from family. We talked about her father a lot. She, um, she really loved her dad. Her dad was um, the biggest thing at, when I met her. Her name is Daphne Franks. She was Kelly Van Dyke's partner in porn movies and stag parties. Kelly, according to Daphne, was shattered because there was a rift between her and her father, Jerry. It was bothering her because they had some kind of falling out. The rift between Kelly and her father turned into an almost perverse defiance of dad. She even made a porn movie called The Coach's Daughter. And one can only wonder what pain it must have caused Jerry Van Dyke. I think, yeah, she did it in a way to, like, hurt him. I know she knew that it would hurt her family because she's, she always, she said once, um, wait till my dad sees this. Tortured by shame, shattered by the rift, stricken with guilt, Kelly was an emotional shipwreck. She was getting more and more upset about her father and I think she was feeling guilty because she was doing the movies and then the coach's daughter thing came out and from there on um, she mentioned her father in all the movies that she did. Watch, listen, and try to grasp this scene Kelly had with Daphne. You know, I always had those dreams about my dad. I think she wanted her dad to say, you know, stop. You, look what you're doing to yourself. Jack Nance knew what Kelly was doing to herself and it drove a knife through his heart. He remembers the last six months of Kelly's life when she was racing towards extinction. First came the booze and then came the antidepressant drugs which got her hopelessly hooked. Every time it would happen, it would be, it was just like a broken record. I can only listen. An almost word for word litany of her anger and her hostility. It was mid-November 1991, far from the Hollywood Hills that Kelly lusted for so much. She was now in Los Angeles in this modest apartment. Jack Nance was out of town on a movie location. Kelly was wallowing in drugs and she plunged into an affair with porn actor Jerry Butler. Jack would learn of the affair in a devastating manner. I know because she did the same thing she did the night she hanged herself. She called me on the phone so I could listen. That was not the Kelly Van Dyke everyone knew and loved, but it was Kelly when she was consumed by a mind-bending antidepressant. I think Kelly was in a lot of pain that she hadn't shared with me inside emotionally, and I think she just reached maybe a breaking point. It's November 15th, Los Angeles. Hollywood has long slipped from her grasp. Kelly's life is ticking away like a stopwatch. That night, there would be a stag party. It would be videotaped, and Kelly would be subjected to the most grotesque invasions. When we come back, we'll leave the mansions of Beverly Hills for a journey to the dark side. It was a secluded place, and it had made me a little nervous. For them, it was a night on the town. For her, it was the eve of destruction. Showbiz kids don't make it to this part of town much. It's a neighborhood where stars normally only stop to fill the tank with gas before driving on. But Kelly Van Dyke was no ordinary showbiz kid. As Steve Dunleavy discovered, for Kelly, this was the end of the road.
The backgrounds of Brandy Cordova, a Native American, and Kelly Van Dyke could not have been further apart. But at this bar, in the seedy area of Burbank, their worlds collided in a cataclysmic explosion when Kelly was hired to perform at a bachelor party that Brandy attended. It was a secluded place and it had made me a little nervous and she was like, well, you know, it's okay, we'll just do it and we'll go. I never knew who she was. I never even expected she would be Coach Jerry Van Dyke's daughter, not even for the closest moment. Kelly and Daphne started to perform and Daphne noticed the change. She was getting too friendly is what she was. She was getting, you know, a little too close and doing a little bit more than she should have. What some of the men at that party did to Kelly could never be described with decency. Brandy tried to protect her, and she took him back to her apartment where she was joined by porn star Jerry Butler and his girlfriend, Lisa Loring, who, like Kelly, had been a child star. In a haze of booze, Kelly took heroin for the very first time in her life, and she talked about suicide. She says, I don't want to live no more. I just want to die. She said, I'm going to hang myself. I feel kind of like... Um, Be honest. The next time somebody ever says I'm going to commit suicide, I'm going to take it a lot more serious than than, than how I took it this time. Kelly called her husband Jack Nance on Sunday, November 17th, at their apartment. She was racked by remorse from the previous night's binge. She was crying in her little girl voice, and I was comforting, comforting her. And uh, treating her very gently because she was in a state. At five o'clock that same afternoon, Kelly called again. She threatened to kill herself. She had taken an antidepressant pill. It was the last call she would ever make. I was terrified because I knew that she had every intention of doing exactly what she said she was going to do. I was trying, you know, as hopeless as I knew it to be, to talk through that drug. And there was silence. It was quiet, quiet. And I said, I love you, Kelly. And I said her name because that meant something special to her whenever I said her name. And there was quiet, quiet. And then I heard Kelly, you know, Kelly's voice. Not the drug, but her voice back, came back, and it was Kelly. And she said, I love you, Jack. And there was hope. Did you know that she had hanged herself? I heard. I hope she's found her peace. I think she did. And I'd like her to know I miss her. I know. I love her and miss her. Kelly left a simple note for her husband, Jack. It said, to know that love is all there is. 